Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I uh, appreciate the offer to come and speak with all of you and spend some time with you over the next uh, day or two. And um, Sunset Cruise was fun. I'm looking forward to dinner tonight and uh, talks tomorrow. So um, very good so far. Thanks to Jose for the invitation and to, for the sponsors for uh, supporting this event. Um, I'd like to continue in the vein of uh, freshwater mollusks. Um, I actually did my dissertation on freshwater fish. I'm a systematist. I studied the evolutionary relationships of organisms. I got my start back uh, on my dissertation back in the late 80s and uh, took advantage of the advent of the polymerase chain reaction, also called PCR, which was a technique used for amplifying DNA and minute quantities so that you could use it for useful questions and projects like uh, forensics and this uh, UCCSI programs that they can get DNA from a single hair follicle, they can get DNA from a uh, sperm sample from someone's underwear or something like this. And so they can, um, likewise, you can get from a slime we heard this morning uh, from a snail crawling across uh, a particular uh, object and getting DNA from their slime. And so all these things have uh, revolutionized systematics and providing characters in the form of DNA sequences so that you can construct evolutionary trees and look at their relationships. And so what I'm here to tell you about is some, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years worth of information about some work I've done on delimiting species boundaries in freshwater mollusks. The freshwater mollusks um, that I'm mostly interested in are from North America. Art gave a uh, great introduction for me. Um, I will repeat a little bit of that uh, just to remind you about some of their life history characteristics of, of interest. But uh, let's, let's see what we got here. So the unionoids are one group that I'm interested in. Unionoids are, uh, as you heard, an order of uh, freshwater bivalves. And they are distributed around the world. It's thought that their uh, diversity and breakup of uh, different families stemmed from the breakup of Pangaea. They're ancient, some 150 million years old. Fossil record goes back even beyond that. Uh, so they're old, they've been around a long time, there are a number of different families. Um, diversity, as you, whoops, uh, diversity as you saw uh, was greatest in the Nearctic region here in North America, uh, which is where I spend most of my time in looking at uh, uh, that particular group. Uh, Art mentioned the life history of these things, Unionids uh, must find a uh, host that they parasitize, typically for unionid mussels in North America, it's a fish, although Gambia salamanders are pointed out. Um, and so they find a, ver a variety of means to attract a fish host, and indeed some of these uh, mechanisms are still being discovered now. As Art said, that they've done a lot of studies in the aquariums, look to see which fish host that the larvae can survive on, but uh, there's no guarantee that that actually happens in the wild. So still a lot of interesting studies, people looking at the co-evolution of fish as a fish host and the evolution of the freshwater bivalves by comparing their evolutionary trees. So here's just an example. I don't know if this translated over. No, it didn't. Uh, this is was a video clip showing um, Lampsilus reed Vienna. You can see the little mantle flap and basically it sits there. This uh, minnow-shaped mantle flap is something that uh, is part of the bivalve. It sits there, wiggles it around, attracts fish to it. And then when the fish of an appropriate host comes nearby, it'll actually uh, release its glaucity, infect the gills of the fish, and then after uh, several weeks to months, metamorphose, drop off, grow up to become uh, an adult bivalve. The 
having an evolutionary tree. Uh, we saw examples of this in uh, Ken's talk this morning for a number of the terrestrial gastropods from Hawaiian lineages. Is kind of a evolutionary atlas or roadmap to provide background to place you as an investigator in the proper framework for asking questions, addressing various hypotheses, so that you can begin to either go back one direction to look at higher relationships of all bivalves, or come back the other way. And so, for example, I'm interested in mostly, I've done a little bit of marcotiferates, but most of the <coughs> unionoid bi biodiversity is four-fifths of the species diversities in the Uniana D family. And of that, most of those are in uh, eastern North America, this group found here. Don't worry about all the names in that right now. Uh, Unionids, uh, as, as Art had mentioned, most diversities in North America, uh, they figured prominently in the pearl button industry when buttons were made. Uh, before there were plastic buttons, people made buttons out of uh, pearl oysters and would cut out buttons shaped uh, objects. And then uh, when the, with the advent of plastic buttons, that industry disappeared and then they started to harvest uh, freshwater mussel shells for the cultured pearl industry. As Art said, they take cut strips out of the shell, make those into blocks, round those out into little balls, insert the ball into a marine oyster, a pearl oyster, and eventually it will layer down some more layers of mother of pearl or nacre, and you have your cultured pearl. In 95, I had started at the University of Alabama. One thing that I was struck by after starting there as a professor way back when was uh, that there was a tremendous amount of aquatic diversity in the state. There are more freshwater turtles, freshwater snails, freshwater fish, and freshwater mussels than in any other state in the US. And yet, uh, it seemed that the fish biologists knew about it with the fish people, the freshwater mussel people talked to the mussel people, Freshwater snail people talk to the snail people, the turtle people talk to the turtle people, but nobody was saying it all in one fell swoop. And so I worked with the nictiologists in the department. We put together this essay. It was one of those things that was uh, uh, very simple. I relied a lot on data, including from Art Bogan's uh, work in the state, and uh, basically described this hot spot of diversity. Lots of species in the state. Unfortunately, many of them are imperiled. We described this diversity, we reported it, and like we were talking about a little bit earlier about outreach and how you reach the public, this, I submitted it to the Journal of Conservation Biology, it was accepted. Uh, it took uh, time to compile the data, of course, but it wasn't like I was out surveying it for the specimens myself. I was going through unpublished reports, some published reports, gathering literature, all that took time, but the paper itself took less time than a lot of my systematic papers that I had done up to that time, and yet it's gotten more attention than just about any other paper that I ever did that spent more time. So it's, um, I got a call from CNN, I got uh, uh, an article uh, written about in the New York Times science page, and it was just on and on. This uh, not bragging, just saying that it's just one of those things that Sometimes the media grabs onto something. Uh, they, it, it goes for a while, you ride the wave a little bit, um, and then it dies out. And now no one knows that Alabama has more freshwater turtles, freshwater mussels, <laughs> freshwater snails, freshwater fish than any other state in the nation. But, so, that's, uh, so after a while, I learned that what you got to do is just, uh, I'll probably write a follow-up, still has just as many freshwater snails. <laughs> freshwater mussels, and, uh, and see what happens. Maybe they'll latch on to it again. I think the media, you can fool them sometimes. So one of those first systematic papers we did, looking at uh, DNA sequence data, was uh, back in 1996. This was with uh, George Davis and Peg Mulvey. And um, it was basically to ask a question. There had been some confusion about the relationships of these freshwater mussels in terms of their relationships, their classification scheme. People didn't really understand 
There are two different hy competing hypotheses of relationships, and you really do need to know what the correct hypothesis is if you're going to ask questions of interest. So, for example, if you're interested in traits about anodontinines versus the pleurobomene, you need to know whether these two are closely related to one another uh, or not. And so um, you have to build a tree sometimes before you can ask interesting ecological or life history questions and other things so forth. And so, for example, the blue, all those lineages shown in blue at one time were united uh, by one classification scheme based on whether the outer gill, the outer demibranch of these freshwater mussels was used uh, by the female to store her larvae. And so if her marsupia, they called it, were charged with larvae and just the outermost gills, they should be all grouped together. So that one character weighed heavily in this particular classification scheme, except was there support for it? And so we built a tree looking at DNA sequence data, and it shows clearly that these three different lineages in blue do not unite together. They're not a monophyletic group in the parlance of systematists. They do not come together. There's no evidence that they're closely related to one another. We since have extended this with uh, former students and postdocs. Dave Campbell's the senior author of this pap paper into uh, looking at some all 37 am amblomine genera. Those are, uh, this is a subfamily of the Unionidae, which is distributed in eastern North America, east of the Rocky Mountains, and about 107 species um, in this particular data set. And from this, this was our ultimate tree of combining a number of different genes and data and taxa. Uh, to look at relationships uh, so that we had finally uh, uh, something for this particular group that others could then use as a framework to ask more uh, precise or focused questions uh, in further detail. And so this is the second part of that tree, and so I hope you've soaked in all these names. And I'll ask during the panel discussion if you can tell me the sister relationship of <laughs> Chlorobema clava and uh, Fuscanaya flava. So remember those two names. And so then after having this giant tree of relationships, that wasn't enough. We felt like we had to look closely at this particular tribe, Chlorobomene. It's within uh, the group of unionid bivalves. And what this told us was you can begin to say that all these species grouped together in a single phylogeny. We started to know that all Pleurobema grouped together here, Syntoxia grouped together, Fuscanaya. And then other things that were kind of strange was Reginiana uh, grouped out very far away from everybody else on the tree. That they used to be thought to be members of the Pleurobomene. And so we actually recognize them as a new genus. And so, um, and that's something you don't do every day, but uh, something that you find um, when you use a molecular character is to look at relationships. Other kind of things you can do once you have a phylogeny, this is in the genus Fuscanaya, is to look at areas of endemism. So for example, this, uh, this uh, map showing the biogeographic areas recognized for unionids, like you have this area here in uh, the kind of Midwest or interior highlands, the Tennessee Basin that Art referred to, the Mobile Drainage Basin, the Eastern Gulf Ranges, Florida Peninsula, Atlantic Ranges, Southern Atlantic, Northern Atlantic, and so forth. And so you can start to map these out on a tree to infer what the biogeographic history might be like for that region. When did these areas all kind of separate from one another, much like Ken was doing with the Hawaiian island fauna? All right, so here's the first example of delimiting species. So Art mentioned that one of the things in the US and in the Arctic um, 
is that we have the Endangered Species Act. And so to recognize, uh, to protect species, often you need to get it listed. And so when I first started at Alabama, um, there was an interest in whether something was truly endangered or not. Well, for it to be truly endangered, you need to know the species boundaries. Just because something looks similar doesn't mean it's the same species. And sometimes, in contrast, when something looks very different, doesn't mean it's not the same species. And in mussels and in snails, that happens time and time again. As Art mentioned, it's very difficult to key out species. And so uh, I know Art used to play the shell game with Jim Williams and other people in the uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. Where you uh, shove shells back and forth. This is true, right, Art? This, I've heard this. And so you slide shells back and forth at the tabletop and you group into different groups of shells. You say, this, I think this is a species. And you say, I think this is a species. And I'm not uh, criticizing them at all, but it, it's problematic. Different people might group them differently based on shell characters. And it's a difficult group. There's plasticity, as Art said, where in the headwaters, you have a different form than you do as you get to the river mouth. And so is that genetic or is that some sort of environmental plasticity? And so genetic characters, DNA sequences, allow you to attempt to sort this out. And they're not prone to uh, any lack of problems either, as I'll get into a little bit later. So anyway, one of the cases that I was uh, confronted with, with uh, Gene Sarb, uh, was the quadrula species complex I'm looking at here. We have quadrula aspirata uh, from the Mobile Drainage Basin in Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, and a little bit of Mississippi. I have quadrula pustuloso, which is a Mississippi drainage basin form, and quadrula quinariana, which is a Coosa River, which is an upland, upstream, uh, species that's found upstream of these guys. This one has very few pustules. This one has a lot of pustules. This one has kind of a blue chevron uh, mark on its shell near on the umbo. This one doesn't. This one doesn't either. These are kind of more quadrate in shape. These are more rounded. And so can we sort this out using genetic data to see, is it one species here? Are we looking at three species, two species, or what? And so we collect a bunch of genetic data. In this case, it was data from a mitochondrial gene. And we looked to see how things sorted out. And what we found was pustulosa, right? Let's see if I can go back. Pustulosa was quite distinct from aspirata. This takes coordination, and I uh, have a hard time managing these things. Pustulosa and aspirate are quite distinct on the tree. They, they group in very different parts of the tree. And so because of that, we tend to say those are two different phylogenetic species, right? They're grouping together phylogenetically, evolutionary-wise, on the tree. So they seem like good species. Kinarena, on the other, one, other hand, uh, is the pustulous one that's upstream of aspirata, groups neatly within aspirata, is not genetically distinct from aspirata. And so it looks like there's two species, and that pustuleless one is just a upstream morph of aspirata. So of course, you could still choose to protect that species for whatever reason, but it shouldn't be because it's a different species. It should be because you're interested in that habitat. Uh, or what have you. Okay, another one is kind of like the, the one that kind of spawned the title, Hidden Diversity in Plain Sight. This is something that we just started recently gathering specimens for uh, in Illinois. I'm now at uh, Western Illinois University. And Lancelot silicoide is not something that is considered to be of conservation concern. It's the least concern. It's very abundant. It's one of the most abundant species in the state of Illinois. Uh, here's a picture of the type specimen from uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology. Here's a description of its height to length and a description 
uh, from Barnes in 1823 when the species was described. Here's the distribution from Nature Surf of Lampsilocylicoidea, widely distributed. These red areas are where it's thought it may be extirpated, but for the most part, seems to be doing well. However, when you go to Illinois and you sample the Illinois Natural History Survey, Kevin Cummings, uh, Allison Stadola, and her colleagues are people I'm working with on this particular project. They go out in the field, they've been doing it for years, and they have found that in the southern part of the state, there's this uh, species that they collect that they've referred to as Lampsilocylicoidea. And so it looks similar to Lampsilocylicoidea. They call it Lampsilocylicoidea, but they're consistently smaller and slightly different shaped. And so for a long time, they've just referred to them as Lampsilocylicoidea, question mark. So they asked me about whether it's possible it could be this other species, Lampsilus hydiana, which here's uh, the type from Isaac Lee's description um, uh, from the Smithsonian. And so it's a couple inches long. The, I don't know what happened to the length there. And here's the distribution of Hydeana. Hydeana is not found. Here's Illinois here. Here's the southern limits of Illinois. So it's never been recorded in Illinois, but it is this uh, western gulf drainage uh, species. So that's why it hasn't been recorded in Illinois. No one's been finding it there. No one's considered it to be part of Illinois. But it's possible, perhaps, that it is actually found in the southern part of the state, just never been recognized as such. So in this study, we, we got about 82 samples from 19 sites, looked at a couple different mitochondrial genes. Mitochondrial genes are kind of the staple for systematists, particularly in uh, uh, 80s and 90s and continue to be so today. Sorry, I have a hard time doing this. Um, and so what we found, we got two different uh, clusters or clades of uh, one which is referred to as silicoidea down here and then another one here which looks like our hydiana clade. And so um, it looks like there are two different distinct entities. Both genes support this pattern. Different analyses support the two recognition of these two groups. Genetic distance-wise, it's at the level you might expect for recognizing different species, um, although you don't usually want to rely on that alone. And here's the distribution. So on these blue dots down here, this is where Hydeana samples were collected, or Hydeana-like samples, and here Silicoidea, and the rest of the, of the state. And so even though from a conservation status, both these species were of least concern, we've just now found another species that we didn't know existed in the state of Illinois. And maybe if these stream habitats aren't doing that well, it warrants recognition or protection at at least the state level. And so you need to know what your units are in order to do the right conservation management plan. And so here's diversity in plant site, been collecting it for years, never knew it was a different species, had some thoughts it could be, evidence suggests it is. Another uh, group is the genus Potamulus, Potamulus alatus, amphicanus, capex, inflatus, ohioensis, perforator, so some of the species that are found in the genus. Um, here's Potamulus alatus. Here's Potamulus perforatus. And here's Potamulus inflatus. All those three species uh, have not had any question about their conservation, about their specific status. They've all thought to be three different species. Um, and so my student, Kevin Rowe, who uh, is first author on this paper, or a former student, 
did uh, this particular analysis of the genus, and we see that purpuratus here is distinct from elatus, and those two are distinct from inflatus. And we notice that within inflatus, there's two different groups, one here and one here, that turn out to be rather quite genetically distinct. And so that kind of turned out to be something that we weren't quite expecting, although in hindsight, it's not that much of a surprise. Here's where those um, populations are from. It turns out those two different groups of inflatus, some are found in the Blackwater River Basin of Alabama, and then some are found in the Amit River of Louisiana. And so they are disjunct populations of seemingly the same species. The reason why it's important to know that they're genetically distinct uh, is because the one in the Mobile Drainage Basin, it was thought needed to be population thought was declining. It was thought that if we introduce more individuals from Louisiana to Alabama to supplement or help enhance that population, that we could then uh, improve the situation for the Alabama one. But in this case, you'd be introducing an entirely potentially different species that's unrecognized into the range of another species, which could result in the collapse and extinction of this distinct evolutionary entity, whether you choose to recognize that as a different species or not. And so knowing the evolutionary legacy of the organisms you're looking at is critical. Okay, now I'm going to shift over to gastropods. Again, this is our uh, evolutionary roadmap. Ponder and Lindbergh did an excellent study of synthesizing over 100 characters of morphological and molecular data, constructing this uh, evolutionary tree of the gastropods. Uh, whoops. Things that um, we'll see a little bit about more are the heterobranchia. Heterobranchs include uh, land snails, a lot of the land snails, uh, not all of them, but most of them, and slugs. And then uh, Cenogastropoda is kind of a more recently named group, recently meaning from a geological perspective, more 1990s as opposed to mid-Miocene. Uh, so, People still use uh, prosobranchia in the literature, um, but prosobranchs are obsolete. It's not a natural group. We shouldn't say prosobranch. People go like this to you back, back up if you're a systematist and you say prosobranchia. So I'm just warning you, okay? Just be careful. It's like Voldemort. You don't say. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, one of the groups of heterobranchs that I'm interested in are physids. And here we have a tree of physids. And I'm actually breaking my own rule because of Fistobranchia is another one that has recently been kind of disassembled. It's not a natural group. We shouldn't say a Fistobranchs anymore. We were talking about, someone mentioned back there about common names are more stable. Well. What we're trying to do isn't make life miserable for people uh, and the names, but actually have names reflect actual lineages on a tree, not some sort of unnatural assemblage that feels good. And so um, here I was interested in physids, and here's Physa acuta. Physa acuta is one physid that's on this tree. It is in a natural group called the hygrophila. Hygrophila are in the pulmonates, pulmonates question mark, because pulmonates too are also now thought to be unnatural. Uh, some have suggested discarding that word from further use. Now that would hurt, right? Because I had that in the title of one of my talks, and one of my <laughs> papers, pulmonata, sorry. But anyway, all good things come to an end. And that's just going to read the way it is. Anyway, physids are freshwater, can handle low salinity. Uh, hermaphrodites, whole electric distribution. Uh, Physa acuta has been distributed all over the world accidentally. 
and on purpose. And uh, some think uh, it was described in France in 1805. Uh, some, like myself, I'm not the only one, think actually it's a native of North America and was described after it got to France. Uh, but not everybody thinks that way. But it's something to try to sort out. It's all over the world now, that's for sure. Tay came up with this uh, influential classification scheme with some 36 species, 43 subspecies, and morphs. These things are impossible to tell apart uh, just looking at the shell, but the basis for most of these species is based on the shell and the morphs and the subspecies. Uh, it's very difficult to tell these apart. Um, what he did contribute that was very helpful, though, was looking at pineal morphology. And so pineal morphology, you can look and see uh, these different glandular and anatomical structures. Here's the distal lens. Here's the proximal lens. Uh, these types he called type C, type BC, type B, type A. And they corresponded to different species groups. And so looking at the soft anatomy, just like with Ken looking at the anatomy carefully, reproductive parts in particular seem to uh, provide useful characters for diagnosing species. We were curious whether how well these characters held up to a phylogeny, a classification based on molecular genetic data. And so we constructed a tree based on mitochondrial genes and here we found, here's a cuta grouped in the yellow. We see Pomelia hendersoni grouped in the green. We see Gyrena grouped here, Stenophysa. And basically, the point is there was agreement between the pineal morphology that you observe in the species and the results of the tree. This kind of concordance between a phylogeny built on genetics and some sort of independent anatomical trait or geography like our uh, patamulus inflatus lends further credence to your thoughts and views on the systematic output of your uh, study. One thing we came curious about, uh, I had a colleague, Rob Dillon, who um, was an advocate of the biological species concept. Biological species concept basically states that if, uh, if a population can interbreed with another population, then it's probably the same species. Um, and so we took, well, he took uh, jars and jars of physids, individuals, and allowed them to mate and then look to see whether there was pre-mating reproductive isolation, right? They wouldn't mate at all together. Or post-mating reproductive isolation, they would mate together or try to, but they didn't successfully have viable offspring, right? And so you can try to mate and succeed, but not have viable offspring. So that's post-mating reproductive isolation. All right, so anyway, he did this work. And what we found was that within a pineal morphology recognized group or phylogenetic clade, we see that there was no pre or post mating reproductive isolation for all these different nominal species that were recognized that um, had the same pineal morphology. So if you have the same pineal morphology, you can mate and nothing's going to stop you from doing so. And you'll successfully have viable offspring. However, if you cross over into another group, like the Pamilia and the Akita group, with a different pineal morphology, you will attempt to mate, but you will not have viable offspring. So there's post-mating reproductive isolation. So this adds support for the biological species concept uh, matching the phylogenetic species concept, which was the one I was advocating. So what does all this mean in terms of physids? Physids uh, aren't particularly of conservation concern, but what it allows us to do when you have 
36 species and subspecies and morphs all recognize there may be a tendency to attempt to protect one of those that's only found in a limited area. Well, maybe you shouldn't protect that because it's just one point in a widely distributed species. And so these things have dozens of names and probably not dozens of species, probably far fewer than that. Final. Uh, Example I'll go through is in the Cenogastropoda, the Cerithioidea, the superfamily. Did some work with uh, Ellen Strong and Winston Ponder and others to look at higher order relationships of the families of Cerithioidea. Um, my primary interest um, was in the family Porosauridae, which, if you call from Art's presentation, uh, is found in North America, especially the southeastern U.S., where it reaches its greatest diversity. I was curious um, how many times freshwater groups evolved in the Cerithioidea. At one time, historically, uh, they were all grouped into the single family Millenniidae uh, with this was based on shell characters, and so there was one group of freshwater mussel, uh, sorry, freshwater cerithioidean in um, the cerithioidea. But subsequent analyses looking at reproductive characteristics revealed, at least on this slide, there are there, that there are at least three families of freshwater um, gastropods, and so. The question became, how many different uh, times did these evolve? Are these all closely related to one another? Or are they distantly related to one another? This one individual, Joe Morrison, proposed that they were um, each derived from a separate marine ancestor. So Ellen put together this uh, gigantic data set with 151 morphological characters. We generated some 16S and 28S uh, genetic data. And here's the tree of the Cerithioidians. And down here is the family Plurosauridae that Art was telling you about. Uh, reaches its greatest diversity in the southeast. And it's closely related to a family called Semisalcospiridae, which includes the genus Juga which Juga it was part of the Plurosauridae, but what this analysis and some other analyses by Ellen showed belongs in a separate family now. So Western Pacific snails are more closely related to, in this group, are more closely related to Eastern Asia species of this superfamily than they are to Eastern North American species of this superfamily. And so, and, and then together these are closely related to the family Melanopsidae. So that's one group of three freshwater families of Cerithioidians. And then there are other freshwater families that are involved here, like the Pachycylidae and Planaxidae, and you know, so the, the Potamididae and the Pelodomidae and the Tieridae. So, Chlorosaurids, um, as I said, reached their greatest diversity in the southeastern U.S. Jeffrey Sides was a former student of mine who did his dissertation on this particular genus of freshwater snails, uh, genus Chlorosaura. What he was interested in doing was looking within the mobile drainage basin, which you've heard so much about already. Um, and you have the Coosa River. Tallapoosa River, Alabama River, Cahaba River, Black Warrior River, and Tom Bigby draining out into the Mobile River, which is actually this tiny stretch here, but the whole basin is called the Mobile River Drainage Basin. Conrad was the first to describe species uh, back in 1834 of Plurosaura in the Mobile Drainage Basin. And then Isaac Lee got his hands on some specimens. And it went up to almost 22 species uh, of Chlorosera in the basin. Goodrich came along from the University of Michigan, attempted to make sense of 
the number of species that Lee was looking at, synonymized a bunch of them, decided it was five species of Pleurosaura. Birch, also from the University of Michigan, in his influential guide to North American freshwater snails said, I'll follow Goodrich and say there's five. And then Turgeon et al. came along and said, I'll follow Birch and said there's five. So Sides, who started this in 2002, he's done now, um, said, how many are there? Is there a way to sort that out? Is it truly five? Was Goodrich correct? Uh, should we still be recognizing five species or what? Here's a plate from Isaac Lee. He had gorgeous plates showing the shells of Pleurosaur and other species on this one. Um, but each individual is a different species. Tremendous amount of variation uh, in the group, but often they were recognized as separate species. Why does it matter? Just as a reminder, because the species that you're recognizing may warrant a particular conservation scheme. And so here we see the global rank of one, a lower number means it's high, more highly imperiled. So P. annulifera is global rank one, Formini global rank one, Prasinata global rank three, Q means question taxonomically, show alter right question mark taxonomically, best in them, global rank three doing okay. And then they have state ranks that range from one to three. But if the taxonomy is a mess, then maybe the ranking system <clears throat> is a mess as well. So Jeff went out, and I helped, and uh, collected uh, snails from throughout the basin. And here's a tree based on 16S, uh, excuse me, cytochrome oxidase 1. And what you can see, if you look at the names, here's annuliferum. Here's annuliferum, here's annuliferum, here's vestidum, here's vestidum, here's vestidum. When you see taxonomically that units aren't grouping together, like all the vestidum come out together, then those are unnatural groups. They're not monophyletic. It's not following traditional taxonomic boundaries the way they were initially recognized. What is, does seem to be happening, however, is there's some relationship to their geography, what drainage basin they're found in. So for example, uh, Prasinatum is found, and Chowalteri are found in the Kusa River, with some found in this group of the Kusa River and some found in the upper reaches of the Kusa River. So this is the lower Kusa, this is the upper Kusa. The light blue is the Cahaba River, and the purple is Tom Begbie, and the yellow is the Black Warrior. And so there is some correspondence with genetics and what drainage basin these things are found in. And so we should be protecting units that live in a certain drainage basin. Protect the Black Warrior River, protect the Kusa River, and you protect those evolutionary units. All right, and that's what I said there. So it turns out if you look at the historical distribution of Vestidum, you see these little yellow polygons here. This is the distribution of Vestidum historically. They're found in all these streams that drain into larger rivers. And so we suppose that perhaps Vestidum is an ecomorphotype. You get a certain Vestidum-like shape. Uh, and style because you live in a small stream, not because you're a separate species. And so um, that's what we think may be going on. Now, with chlorosaurids, there's complicating factors. Mitochondrial DNA markers are the ones that I've pretty much used throughout my career. But mitochondrial DNA markers have their own shortcomings. Um, in some snail groups, they are problematic. Um, we need to explore other markers, nuclear markers. A number of these studies, we had nuclear ribosomal genes, but other markers are necessary. With the advent of more genomic data, we need to explore genomic data. 
uh, get more nuclear genes involved in assessing the situation so you can rule out other factors that may be problematic to rely solely on mitochondrial genes. But anyway, that's the message of this presentation. I think that's it. So thanks very much.